This is my absolute favorite topic. And we're going to do another one of these in about a month. Uh, probably sometime in January. Uh, on, a, on a project that we worked on that lasted for four years. Uh, we learned a lot. It was very interesting. Um, let's get past that guy right there and let's talk about energy. It is the most important aspect of managing leaks, in my opinion, are, are the results in energy. Energy and maintenance are very uh, tied together. You do a great job on maintenance and you get some great results in energy. And there are two studies that I'm going to refer to very heavily throughout this entire discussion. One of them I, I will refer to as the Kim study and another one uh, is the Bostock study. And Bostock draws heavily on Kim. Uh, these studies go back 10 years. Uh, they have results that are manifested throughout the period up and through 2017. But the numbers that I'm, I'm sharing with you right here come from uh, facilities net on the left side here. And the maintenance accounts for between 30 and 75% uh, for HVACR throughout the building, the power, 44%. All right. Um, these systems are, we're mostly referring to field built systems when we talk about leaks. However, we're going, I'm going to share some results with you from the Kim study, which is published by Purdue University. And the, the Kim study will actually point to package units uh, primarily. But, you know, these things sit outside in, in inclement weather. Uh, they go through a number of different temperature changes, and that leads to a significant loss in refrigerant. And the, um, the numbers can be kicked around. Uh, by a lot of different people, and they usually use them to create some type of story for themselves. But leak rates in the United States are generally 25%. And, and every time I talk to someone, they'll tell me, well, my system didn't leak 25%. Well, if that one didn't leak 25%, another one had to leak more. Uh, so the average leak rate in the U.S. is 25%. And that increase in leak rate leads to a corresponding uh, increase in energy. All right, so I've already talked about that. I beat this topic up constantly. And the system de performance is dependent on the charge level in the system. And I want to point out, although we're here primarily to talk about undercharged systems, you know, systems that have leaked, overcharged systems perform equally badly. And I have some great charts to share with you on that. And anyone can stop me at any time, and I'm happy to talk about any of it, because this isn't me giving a lecture. This is me socializing a topic. Um, and I think this one speaks for itself. Uh, and I, I pulled this, this information from the Kim study. And as you'll see here, you know, this is table eight from the study, which is pretty lengthy. Um, the the narrative at the bottom there explains everything. And a lot of times you'll hear people talk about SEER ratings, and energy efficiency. Well, none of those things are useful to talk about unless the system charge is accurate. So you can't get a good SEER rating even if you buy the most SEER efficient unit if, if you don't balance the charge and get that dialed in correctly. Anyone want to ask anything? Steve, this is a great chance for you to jump in. Chart speaks for itself. If you're under charge, look at that number five you've selected at 75% charge. You've dropped your SEER to under 11 versus uh, if it was up at 100%, it would be close to a 14 SEER unit. So, and look at the cost savings as well. So you picked a good chart to show the, the difference in losing 15% of your charge. In this case, 25% yeah. of your charge. Yeah, this was uh, this was actually a depressing chart the first time I read it. Um, and I don't want to tell you my opinion on getting the SEER rating right throughout the industry, but um, I realized that all of these very expensive, fancy systems with higher energy efficiency ratings, if not, poor, if not properly installed, will never perform uh, at, at expected levels. It's just like a car's gas mileage. Well, they do it on a basically on a treadmill. If you put it out in the wind, guess what? 
it drops. So AHRI does its best to get the sear ratings right. And now you're right. If you put it in backwards, undersized return ducts, under, oversized supplied ducts, or whatever, wrong, wrong size piping if it's a field split system. Yep, it all adds up to uh, you're not going to get what's published and proven by the uh, agency that, uh, or the, the organization that does set those, not the standards, but that measures the efficiency and rates them and allows them to hit the marketplace. Yeah, I pulled some numbers this morning and um, I actually talked to a client, you know, for, as we started this discussion a couple of weeks ago and I asked him to do a favor for us and he did, and they pumped down four units and the uh, <laughs> the closest charge in accuracy, the closest, was at 80% of capacity. That's the closest of four units. I thought this was pretty shocking, and it was actually really nice that he did this for us. Um, the worst ratio, the very worst, was at about 50%. So four units randomly selected, him and his team pumped them down and put the charge back and the original material taken out, all of these units were running. None of these were down for failure. Nothing was turned off. There were no alarms. They were operating as expected and 50 to 80% charge capacity based on what the expected requirements were. So I, I was fascinated by that. All four, not one of the units was above 80% of the expected charge. When I saw this slide last night, I wondered what type of system was that? Of the four that I've just mentioned? Oh, oh, this one here. Oh, this one's actually an aggregation of a whole bunch of system types. And I'm going to share with you two of the system types now. But this was about six different system types averaged together. So uh, let's take a look. So here's one. Uh, so you can see on this one, I don't think I talked about the charge on this one, but uh, the charges on these were all under 50 pounds. And you can see, regardless of whether it had an accumulator or no accumulator, the energy drop-off is significant. So the capacity, as it drops off in charge, goes down significantly. And it, and it's, it is universally uh, similar. Does anyone... Anything you want to reflect on there, Steve? Any questions? And I have these reports. No, They're spread throughout on my computer. But. It's, it's consistent. You're, under, you're not at the optimum charge with, uh, with your uh, proper charging techniques. Then uh, energy and performance suffers. It's, that's, that's the engineering rule. Yeah, and, and it's... It's an amazing how infrequently it's talked to. And by the way, the company that I worked with today, uh, you know, to get the results this morning, the feedback, they are a really well-run company. And the manager did this project because he was intrigued that I didn't believe that his systems were, were at charge. And they have some very good contractors and service providers doing work for them. And, and, you know, we talked about it and I said to him, well, when was the last time you brought the service provider in, you talked to them about the charge and you had a conversation? And he said, we just don't have the time. He said, we're, we're patching things together. We're trying to keep maintenance budgets low. And he said, Ted, this is a sign that we're wasting a lot of money on energy that we could be spending on preventative maintenance. And I, I was thankful to him that he did it. And, and he was kind of thankful to us for bringing it up. Um, but if you look here, each one of these examples, there are no examples in any of these studies. And again, this report, these um, graphs are from the Kim study as well. And you can see the drop off. And, but I want you to note right here, the charge level, if you can see, and can you guys see my, um, here, if you, 
let's see, if you see my, my pointer, the, um, the charge level at 100% is 100%. But look what happens over here. It, it still doesn't perform at optimal, right? It, it drops off. Performance drops off again. But boy, does it drop off when you've got a leak. And we, um, we actually, the, the t discussion we'll do next, next month, we'll talk about this a little bit more. But the question is, at what performance level does maintenance then get performed, right? And, you know, most of the time we wait for failure before we go out and we do a charge. It's the hot call. It's the product loss call. HVACR self reports when it gets, when it hits the critical point, you'll lose energy, you'll lose energy and performance. But then when it gets to the critical point, that's when the hot calls come, right? They're right. self-reporting. And, and one of the things that we're, we're really trying to help our clients better understand, because this is super important, is what is that trigger? Is it, is it the butter's melted? It's trending towards melting. Um, over the last two weeks, when I knew I was going to be giving this, I, I actually called a bunch of people. And um, of course, a lot of our experience is in the grocery space. So that was a big part of my audience. And I asked them questions about air conditioning. And, you know, they could tell me a lot about refrigeration. But when it came to air conditioning, it was sort of extra right? They, they didn't pay as much attention to that. And, um, you know, one of the answers I got, which I thought was very honest is, well, when the air conditioning is po performing poorly or, or has a leak, we probably don't notice it until it's almost dry because the refrigeration units put out more cooling to compensate for the air conditioning. Our industry had a bad habit of over-designing stuff especially in the late seventies, early eighties, cause that drove up your project costs and uh, got your, got your fees up. And, uh, and then operations was left with trying to wring it all out and optimize the freaking building. I was in uh, an energy certified energy manager in the late seventies, early eighties. And that was before compliance came. And the energy guy was the most hated guy on the block before environmental came with a compliance. Cause you're trying to drive down energy. No one cared cause energy was cheap. So when you tried to promote this stuff, it was like you were the anti-operations person. So I made a few calls about that. Um, yeah. And anyone's welcome to contribute who's on the call. What I found from the group of people that I've been talking to over the last two weeks, because I haven't talked about this for about a year, I, I, I wanted to get an idea of what they were paying a kilowatt. And the number is around 12 and a half cents a kilowatt. So uh, the numbers got really significant really big uh and we're going to know more about that we have a, a really interesting project that kicks off this month and we're going to be able to share those results in about a year and it all started because of a young group of guys out of oak ridge lab trying to create efficiency in defrost cycles for grocery stores and they thought well if we could solve this one grocery store problem you know we'll be millionaires um, what they didn't realize is the impact on traffic, uh, inventory, air conditioning, uh, climate. I mean, all of these things went into that, that um, evaluation and that metric. And boy, it's going to be a fun study. So um, now, you know, the Institute for Refrigeration, you know, out of uh, England, I, I love to talk with those guys. It's a great group. Um, this is actually the Bostock study, these, these two slides. Um, and this is an oversimplified chart. Let me just start there. Uh, because I have other charts that are far more aggressive on the overall cost of energy across total cost of ownership. But I went with this one because it was so darn simple that it didn't take a lot of, of imagination to understand that the impact from energy over maintenance was significant. Uh, and, and if you notice here, um, this is an older study, this 2013 one, still relevant for the record. Uh, as the refrigerant charge dropped off, the running costs went up significantly. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it, it's a real thing that everyone's uh, wrestling with on the other side of the coin. 
Does anyone have any questions about this slide either? I have a question that maybe isn't related to the slide, but um, from the contractor side, a lot of times we're told to get an appliance up to a specific level on the receiver. And I just wondered what, if any relationship exists between the receiver level and that refrigerant charge percent? So it's actually a great question. Um, there's a really funny answer to this. So about 11 years ago, the state of California implemented this thing to improve the floating suction devices that were refrigeration, you know, in the stores, right? They have a large receiver. So let's lower the amount of charge, right? Increase, um, you know, the, the subcooling, right? So this, what this does is it's supposed to create efficiency at the compressor. So they, they spent, I think the number was $45 million uh, in what they referred to as a demand side management program geared towards uh, floating suction and refrigeration. And well, how it manifested itself was a massive effort to update all of the uh, control boxes that grocery stores use to manage their, their load and, and the, the capacity in those receivers. Well, as a result, the charge levels were able to be dropped. And oftentimes we get asked this question and I'm, I already know how long someone's been in the industry based on how they ask this question. And they'll say, why is the capacity different than the charge, right? And so Cynthia, this is kind of a long way answer to what you were asking. And the question is, is incredibly important, but it's almost irrelevant. The capacity and the charge will rarely ever be the same. In 98% of the cases, they hardly ever match. So somewhere along the way, some person who operates that unit has created a universal understanding that I'll make it a, a, a bold statement. 45% of, of capacity is what we're going to operate at. All right. The, some engineer made a chart. I've heard it hundreds of times a month. I hear it from grocers all the time. Ted, we want them to charge to 45%. So let's say someone goes and adds a hundred pounds of refrigerant and it goes from 45%, maybe it was down to 38 and now it's at 50. I don't know how much of that refrigerant was actually a leak, right? Only about a change in 7% capacity is, you know, a significant change. But then all of a sudden we went from 45 to 50, right? So now we're operating at 50. So the next time someone goes back out, what was the receiver level when they got there? So we answer this question all the time, but we don't put it in context to what the, the performance expectations are. So maybe you had a 5% leak, you know, making up fake numbers and, and you added 10%. So it looks like a 10% leak at that capacity. Does that make sense, Cynthia? Um, it sounds like there's not really an answer. Well, <laughs> like there's there, a lot there of information is. out there and maybe each person kind of decides what they think is correct. But is there like an industry standard of no. here's, okay. No, you're maybe right. It would maybe it would help if we explain the purpose of a receiver. These were created before regulations. Uh, back refrigerants were cheap. It's to allow critical systems to operate under all conditions, cold, low load, uh, leaking. In other words, our product has got to be protected. So we want the refri refrigerants cheap compared to, you know, losing a, the meat case. So that was the thinking in the beginning of these things. So a lot of these legacy systems have carried over uh, engineering, you know, they get the stuff in there, uh, put this size receiver in. Uh, in the old days, we'd run up at 90% or 100, you know, you don't want to be too much, but, you, you know, then you'd, you'd show up you do less maintenance because the, you know, if there were leaks, uh, you got a longer period of time between them. So then regulations come along and then cost, refrigerant costs has gone up. So a lot, like you said, Cynthia, they're, they're uh, <clears throat> putting these numbers on with no real, you know, it's what that store chain seems to operate at best. The lower you set that number, 
the more frequent you got to go out there, especially if it's a way far away store, uh, because you don't have that reserve. Think, think of it as a reserve. Yeah, think of it as a battery. He's yeah, right. Battery. Extra energy exactly. stored and up. It's, it's contrary. It's it's not good for compliance, right? It was, so uh, it the lower they set it, the 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 more you know more service you might need if it's a if it's an old leaky system. Uh, but is that kind of you, you know you're you're heading down the right path? You're told to do this for that client, this for that. But in the reality, uh, you know, if you took all that receiver away and the system was properly set up the first time and and, the, and there was no leaks, it was set up to operate with just what it had in there. So, the, so everything the receiver has is just extra to allow for longer running when the, when the conditions are worse. And, uh, and it gets complicated because we hear yeah. people talk about like system charge and a lot of these units are field built refrigeration. But if we look at air conditioning, the leak rates that I was sharing with you, these are all air conditioning systems. And as the charge gets more and more critical, the leak becomes more and more impactful towards energy. And, you know, I had a conversation and I'm probably the worst person to call about this because someone will call and say, what should I do on my PMs for compliance? And I'll, I'll ask them, you know, what, what they're doing now and how they're planning it. And then I'll ask them how they tie PMs to energy. And they're like, why is a compliance guy asking us about energy? Well, we're also an Energy Star partner, and you know we're very passionate about our, our environmental stewardship, and we don't want to see you save money on refrigerant emissions only to spend it on on uh, CO two related to energy, right? So, so we're paying attention to all these things, and it's you know in your case, Cynthia, it's really it's an interesting opportunity for for service providers to talk to their clients about an energy audit at the same time you're doing a PM and to do one or the other and not tie them together becomes a very um, insufficient uh, set of, you know, performance evaluations without an end in sight. Um, our, our clients on average, the energy to maintenance spend is about 10 to one for every dollar in maintenance, they spend $10 in energy. So there's a lot to be made up there. But these numbers really show how the degradation in charge, you know, just the reduction in charge impacts both cost and performance. All right. Now, I pulled this from the Department of Energy's uh, website. These are, you know, so two of these, three of these we're very, very familiar with. Um, convenience stores, uh, I'm really fascinated by, 560 kilowatts per square foot. So much cooling. I'll hear people say to me, "Well, we're not really concerned with compliance in the in the in the convenience store because it doesn't matter." Well, it it does matter. Um, in the convenience stores we work with, our goal number for them is closer to 480. Uh, is to get that, and the leak rates are very high in, in the initial group of uh, convenience stores that we're working with very, very high. Uh, data centers are just ridiculous. Um, and, you know, colleges and universities and hospitals are no slouch either. I mean, these are high density energy environments. And these are the ones that are so affected by the capacity charge. Anyone have any questions? I mean, this is just my sampling from the DOE site. I thought it was useful. All right, this is my favorite chart of the day. So this is the COP over the charge in kilograms. And I pulled this from an old study. Um, and I'm gonna tell you when we talk about this next month, this old study will come up and um, some absolutely fascinating numbers. Uh, and the study that we're gonna talk about next month is actually from Abu Dhabi. And uh, they are not well, it's actually in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and the um, they are really not an oil wealthy nation, and so it means that they don't really have free energy or low access. And how they see every barrel of oil is every barrel that they consume is equivalent to 10x in revenue for them at export. 
So they don't want to export any oil, trust me. They, I mean, they don't want to keep any oil. They want to export all of it. They want to send it to us. They want to set up solar farms and they want to make sure that their, their um, uh, natural resources that they take out of the ground, they can export. And uh, this, this chart here kind of kicked off a very long uh, four-year discussion. And I want you to notice, you know, what's, what's exactly happening here. Because uh, it seems uh, pretty obvious, but when you start looking out in this area and you start to see this drop off, right? So the COP, and you look at this degradation, it's significant. And it's, it's equally bad on both sides. The only reason uh, this doesn't go over 140% of charge is you're full. You can't fit any more in. So that's the maximum. And you can see these are small charge systems. And I really like to pull things uh, from, from other areas because what it shows is it doesn't matter if you're using a large system or a small system, charge, inappropriate charge leads to increases in energy. And being blind to it or not talking about it is is going to be a thing of the past because as we move towards a, a lot more AI devices, you know, artificial intelligence, um, what we're going to find is somebody is talking about this, even if you're not. Somebody is approaching a CFO in a company somewhere and telling them that they can drive energy efficiency. And if you're not part of the discussion, that means you're on the sideline. And if you're on the sideline watching and you're not part of the solution, then someone else is likely to displace you. So it's really a very important topic. I think it's the most important topic. Um, actually, you can't get me to stop talking about uh, leak rates and energy impact. Uh, all right. This is from an EPA report in 2008. 10% uh, reduction in energy uh, is equivalent to increasing the profit margin by 16% in a grocery store. Uh, man, when I heard this the first time, I latched onto it. When we talk to convenience stores, we ask them how many packs of cigarettes it takes to offset the cost of uh, refrigerant loss based on energy. Um, we worked on a Department of Navy study uh, and then got a copy of the study. And boy, what a absolutely amazing set of results. Um, the Navy's results suggest that doing no maintenance and operating equipment until failure is better than doing maintenance and just making sure you replace the unit at seven years. All right. Um, does anybody want to react to that? Because I know that shocked me. And if it's not shocking you, uh, that's scary. <laughs> Steve, you want to say anything? Well, every Navy facilities management person I ever ran into had the most painted mechanical equipment rooms I'd ever seen. It seems like they painted everything even if it wasn't working right, but it looked good. So if you got a pig, paint that pig, put lipstick, lipstick on it. So that's kind of what I said, you know. Oh, well, you know, I, I worked on a bunch of Navy ships over my career, I was lucky. And, and the guys would tell me that the cleaner the ship, the easier it was to spot the leak. Sure. So yeah, I get that. Um, I had cleaned up a upstate New York hockey rink uh, compressor that was, that was because they had the guard off the shaft seal, so the, the oil was going all over the ceiling and all up and down the walls. So it wasn't hard for an inspector to walk in and go, I think it's leaking. <laughs> so the la last time I went there, that place was purdy, and they <laughs> replaced the compressor and the shaft seals, and yeah, it was. Uh, they made it made it look good, even though it had a past history of a horrific loss. The Navy study is 1,100 pages long, and it cost the Navy over $100 million to do this study. And I take that pretty seriously. I mean, I was fascinated by it. I read the entire thing twice. Um, and I, I go back to it all the time still. Uh, but for the purpose of being efficient today, the two most easily accessible reports out there are the Kim study and the Bostock study. And you can find them. I can help you point you in the right direction if you need it. But one of the things that came from the Navy study was that systems running at less than normal charge had a 63% higher wear factor. And I want you to correlate that wear factor in a, a really one-to-one -one ratio of shortening its life. We even had one grocer that we were talking to about leak rates. Actually, they're more of a retailer. 
And what they found was that equipment on the highway side of the building, so the closer the equipment was to the highway, uh, endured a significant decrease in equipment life. And, you know, Cynthia, you know, I, 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 I'll refer back to you, I, but like if you're a maintenance person and you're doing work on an equipment, a piece of equipment, and you don't know what the expected life cycle is and you're trying to keep it alive, but the, the owners or the, the people who run it know that the equipment is only expected to live for seven years, uh, and you're trying to keep it alive in year 13 at, at a budget, boy, that's a hard job. Um, let's see, warranties, and, and Cynthia, stop me if you want to comment or just tell me to stop talking to you. I can do that too. Um, uh, chem chemical sites, uh, salt spray sites, the, more, the closer you are to the ocean, obviously, and closer you are to the harmful chemicals at a plant. I mean, sometimes air-cooled equipment, we get four years, and that was coated equipment. It left the factory that was coated, uh, but it didn't take long for the coating to get nicked or whatever, and then the corrosion to build up under the coating. You might get four years out of something that was, you know, ASHRAE or uh, HRI says 17 years. So it also has to do with what's the environmental conditions this equipment's living in. Yeah, by the way, that equipment that I mentioned from this morning was a not all the same age, uh, oh, between 13 and 15 years old, I think is comfortable to say based on what he told me. A couple of, one of the pieces, he didn't know how old it was, the nameplate was gone. Uh, but this is related to the age issue. And um, he was really funny, he said to me, uh, well, now that I know what's happened, I'm, I'm gonna put them in for retrofit. <laughs> I said, well, why don't you just replace them? <laughs> You know, it's not my money. And, and he said, you know, that's a good idea. Maybe I will look at replacing. His immediate thought, press was, thought process was use my maintenance budget, not my CapEx budget to fix this. And when I mentioned that to him, he goes, oh, yeah, I guess I, I should have asked somebody else. He said, I, I, you know, he moved on pretty quickly. But um, age is a big deal. You know, you're retrofitting a 15-year-old unit that's had leaks or is operating below capacity and anyone who's done service, you know, you walk up to an old chiller, or old um, uh, rack and you go to, they tell you, Oh, it's got about 800 pounds. You pump out 400 and, and they're going, well, okay, that's, that's expected. And that thing's running at 50% charge. So it's, Anyways. Well, and most retrofitted systems leak worse than the original system. You just have hopefully a cheaper, less harmful refrigerant in it, but you know. All right. Look, this is my, my favorite topic. So I'm, I couldn't do this discussion without talking about the sustainability impact, right? I, I mean, that's why we get out of bed every day. Um, the energy impact is at least, at least four times more in CO2 than the impact from uh, the material emissions over its life. So we always hear about HFC emissions. And here in the United States, we, we vent around 600 million pounds a year. Um, it might be 585, but I'm, I'm rounding uh, the 600. And, and no one really knows the exact number because of the way uh, we track uh, supplier gas and end of life. But um, those 600 million pounds will have a significant impact on energy. So anyways, anyone have any additional questions? Because that's about it. That was a lot of slides, the most I've ever presented in one of these little um, open mics, but um, happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ted. Uh, hi, hi, Ted. It's uh, Adrian here. I'm, I'm based in, in Europe. Um, thank, thanks for the session. Um, just uh, done some really, really uh, interesting points there. I, I was just going to uh, ask a bit of a general interest question around, uh, you mentioned uh, sort of 25% average leak rates across the US. Um, you know, in, in my experience, I've sort of seen the, the supermarkets sort of towards the sort of 30% end and, and perhaps over this way, the, the the air conditioning chiller is more towards sort of maybe uh, ten percent. I was wondering if that was sort of reflected in in your sort of experience there. 
Um, and, and maybe if so, where you see the majority of the leaks in, in you know, let's say, water cool or air conditioning chillers, you know, from, from your experience. Yeah, Adrian, that, that parallels what California studies did when they were, when they were laying out their uh, California Resources Board rules. They chose in the early days, and still today, to, to not regulate the uh, comfort cooling sector because they had the lower leak rates, mm -hmm. uh, and that the refrigeration systems, the industrial process refrigeration systems, things that you know are really working hard to make low temperatures, they seem to have the you know, those higher pl pl plus. You throw in the people working in those in those uh, grocery store areas and the buffers and the big equipment and the load, you know, bringing in product and banging into things, loading things wrong. So you, you overcomplicate things, which results in higher leak rates. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. complexity to doing a supermarket, right? Versus yeah. a chiller, a chiller sitting in its nice little basement room <laughs> with nobody around, right? Yeah. And it gets all the attention. And uh, yeah, it you're right. It's it the the big commercial, I call them the class A space, you know, colleges, university, where you're using a, a big water cooled chiller. Those things, they, except for Yorks, they run for years. I'm, I'm an old train guy. I like, I don't like <laughs> shaft drives, but yeah, yeah, they, they run with very low leak rates. Uh, yeah. Well, we're not, you know, all right. So two, two comments on that. So one, as we're having this discussion right now, the state of California is wrapping up their open discussion on implementing uh, comfort cooling controls the same way they do refrigeration. So that's going to happen this year. Uh, mm -hmm. By the 31st, we'll know the structure of those regulations and they'll go into place in 2023. Okay. Um, and there'll be a registration process uh, in 2021, a voluntary one for everybody for comfort cooling. And then it may become mandatory. But the issue is we, we leak more refrigeration, refrigerants, but we leak 100% of all gas that goes into comfort cooling over its life. See, Adrian, in the United States, we don't have a good end of life destruction schedule for material. So what ends up happening is if it's produced, it's actually vented. Hmm. Only about 3% of all materials are destroyed in the course of a year but most of that 3% comes from um, off-blend chemicals out of the manufacturers. So if they produce- Yeah, that's interesting, yeah. It, it, it's, it's frightening. So mm. I hear from the micro perspective, you know, oh, I think these units are leaking less, but from a macro perspective, we look at total gas produced versus total gas destroyed. Yep. And it's over 97% is vented. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit scary. Yeah. <laughs> and another yeah. another complexity is a lot of the governments they don't um, they don't report emissions equally. So the Montreal Protocol reports uh, HCFC and CFC emissions, but not the GWP relevant to those. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Kyoto um, started this trend of reporting the GHG gases but only the ones that the countries recognize and only mm. what's produced. So the U S doesn't really produce many HFC components, for instance, Europe same about the same ratio. So mm. most of the components are actually produced in China, some in India it's growing. So they report really high GHG emission numbers. And after it's produced and it's shipped to the U S if we didn't produce the gas, right? And, and we didn't have any involvement in, in the plant, then in the same in Europe, those countries do not have to report it. So if we import a hundred million pounds of 410, but we didn't produce it, the US will not report it on their GHG emission balance sheet. Mm, okay. Right. Yeah, my understanding for Europe is if it is imported already pre-charged, it, it is still um, recorded because they you're probably aware they've got the quota systems in place. Yeah, for for that now, especially around HFCs. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I refer I, I, to I Canada point. because we're not lucky enough to have a a Paris Accord um, <laughs> agreement. The like Kigali yeah. agreement would be nice too, but we don't. Yeah, have yeah. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, okay. 
But anyways, I'm happy to share this with anybody. I, yeah. I talk about this all the time. Yeah, maybe just a, just a follow-up question to that is, is, is do you see the field-built systems that are going in at the moment, do you see them as being more leak resistant to say a field-built system put in place 15, 20 years ago? So I'm as in, in, I'm in 10 to 15 years, are we going to see the same leak rate? Yeah, we are. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to start it and I'll let Steve finish it. Yeah. 15 years ago, if you were to charge a system, you would almost have the full charge in the system before it shipped from the factory to be placed in service on a package unit. Today, those field charges and those charges that they leave the plant with are nominal charges, which means that the field has to then do an adjustment to the charge. Mm -hmm. And when they do the adjustment, this is where we see a lot of the problems. And so did the Navy, by the way. Mm -hmm. The US Navy found that field adjusted charges led to a, a what they referred to as a bathtub curve uh, impact to life. So it, it starts off here and its ability to succeed drops down before it goes back up, which means for every touch that that system endure, you know, impact is impacted by uh, maintenance, it drops the um, uh, quality of the system's operation for a year. Okay. So Steve, you wanna? Adrian, welcome back. It's been a few, been a month or so since we had John, but uh, what I've seen been loading into our, our software product is uh, grocers that are trying to get away from the 50 pound rule. Can you believe that? Not only at the federal level, but at, in the California. We've even had these systems go here in Arizona where I live, which isn't affected by uh, annual reporting directly to the to the state, but uh, they're using different things. So they're basically going to the under 50 pound charge systems. They're putting in water loops in a lot of cases, just like a water source heat pump air conditioning system. Uh, they don't need the boilers like you would for heating, but uh, so, so to dissipate the heat without direct, you know, dumping it into the store space. Uh, but I see a lot of that. We're getting some, sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a hybrid. We'll have the, uh, uh, hydrocarbon cases, you know, right now at 150 grams max per circuit, but uh, we'll see a combination of those and, you know, HFC or HFO systems, uh, but, but with the loops and, and a full charge under 50 pounds. So I'm seeing some of that, but here again, that, that complicates your service. You better have better maintenance in that case. Uh, and the leak rates, you know, it's eventually going to leak because we have the same factors. We have the people loading these cases, right? That, that the uh, mm -hmm. same people operating it just, uh, you know, we don't have the massive leak. So, you know, but it, it's to be seen whether, what's the life cycle cost? Is the smaller systems less efficient? Uh, oh. It's yet to be seen, but that's yeah, kind of what I'm seeing. They're, put, they're spending more money up front to do this because it's more expensive than the traditional rack method or distributed rack method. Uh, but it keeps, it keeps, so that are getting rid of the quote, uh, regulatory cost. Right, they're getting rid of the obligation to report or record, right. but it, we're, we're not seeing any change in, in leak rate at all. I mean, as you would think by 2020, we would see huge advances, but the <laughs> exactly. emission rates are staying high. Um, maintenance teams are being challenged. The, and I think a lot of it starts with that initial field charge. When train carrier, York, McQuay, anybody was doing an installation, they charge those units very well, very specifically. Now that they're being charged in the field, you don't see as many scales being used. The systems are often undercharged uh, to start. And then as a result of that, they perform poorly, which leads to a failure. That failure then leads to additional maintenance. And that's where we believe most of the refrigerant loss is taking place. Well, I can, I can speak to that as a person that used to host uh, people coming to La Crosse, Wisconsin to see their, their chillers run to have the performance test based on the way they ordered them. So to AHR, AHRI conditions, well, it was ARI that back then, but right. uh, so they would come, we would see the thing, we, the system was charged, obviously to perform at that a ARI performance level. And then when we get them into the 
to the buildings, we'd get complaints sometimes. So we'd have, we'd send a team down there because uh, when you, when your star product is being criticized, you dispatch a team. And then what we usually found was, Ooh, maybe that consulting engineer under, <laughs> under, under, understated what the loads really were. So now we're pushed, we have to push harder because the loads are higher, but because mm-hmm. we had over design, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there's a whole lot of dynamics going on. So what we had, we just put teams in there. We then optimized to the actual conditions and then we got it charged properly. Right. And it might be less, but it's, it was typically more. And uh, then, then you throw in the old R11 chillers coming back and now we're going to do a, a corporate overhaul and put in a new uh, a three wheel machine, mach- optimized 123 wheels you know, keep the condensers and evaporators, and then you start all over again. Okay, so uh, all of these things have worked through, but yeah, it's it, it's yeah. a good balance between yeah, what you get. Yeah. So the long answer is emissions <laughs> rates have continued to increase with installed capacity at an equal rate. So you do the yeah. best you yeah. can. Like I say, <laughs> engineering and then operations has to live with it and make it work. What was that, Adrian? Sorry. No, no, I was just saying, yeah, they're, they're all, uh, yeah, scary but valid points, yeah, well, uh, well done. Yep, it's, uh, and that's why, so as we're talking, I'm, I'm sure at this point, California's wrapping up their call in about 40 minutes, uh, and they're implementing refrigerant and maintenance controls for uh, air conditioning comfort cooling systems. So, and, you know, the good news is there'll be a reference point there for improvement. And even though globally, I don't expect to see those requirements go into action anywhere else, uh, although I think they would help, um, there'll be a good reference point. So to create a dialogue between uh, maintenance teams and building owner operators and, um, and discuss how to drive energy costs down. California, actually, I don't think maintenance alone will will get this topic over the threshold but the energy star program uh, which has portfolio manager requires a reduction in energy in in la county by 20 percent uh over the next three or four years elizabeth probably knows better than i do but um i think that's going to drive maintenance improvements Yeah, fair, fair enough. Anyways, yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining. Um, if you guys want any uh, any of the information or you need the report, just email email us, and I'll make sure you get a copy. All right. All right. Cynthia, any questions as we sign off? Did you fall asleep? <laughs> um, no, I enjoy the discussion that goes, you know, beyond my expertise. But um, what you were saying earlier about the, the individual who went straight to, oh, let's retrofit rather than replace, we definitely see that a lot with our quoting and customers would rather, you know, save a penny today yeah. on the cost of repair than, you know, look at the long-term costs of what replacing the unit could save. Well, after today's discussion in California, I think that will change for you a lot out there. A lot. So, um, and we'll have a discussion about what California is doing as well sometime over the next month or so. We have, we have a number of these. We're going to ease off through the holidays because everybody's taking time off, uh, although we'll be around, including old one eye there. Oh, uh, oh I didn't mute my camera. I, oops, I, sorry. <laughs> I thought I was muted. I only have one eye. What did you expect? I can only see one thing at a time. Steve has a detached retina, so he's coming around. He's doing better. All right. Anyways, guys, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks. Bye, Adrian. Nice talking okay. to you.